he will tell us about double copy construction for gauge supergravities and non-compact young male Einstein supergravities. Marco. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So first of all, can can you hear me all right? Is the sound quality okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So let me start by. Um, so you can hear me. You can see. So we are halfway through, I guess. So let me start uh, uh, by uh, thanking the organizers for for inviting me to um, have this talk. Uh, so today I want to talk, uh, um, as uh, Radu said, about uh, uh, double copy construction for uh, some very particular kinds of uh, supergravity theories. Uh, I should mention this is work done in collaboration with uh, Gunaidin, uh, Johansson, and, and Radu. Um, and I will talk also about some, some work which we are yet to put out and which hopefully we'll put out in the next uh, month or two. Um, so let me start uh, with a plan uh, for the talk. Um, I, aside from the introduction, I want to uh, review some of the basic tools which we will use for uh, the double copy constructions for, for the classes of theories we are targeting. Uh, there are two main uh, um, methods or, or uh, technical tools which we will use or which we need to discuss uh, that is a color kinematics duality for theories with massive fermions um, and some um, development about uh, the equivalent of the spinor elasticity formalism in five dimensions, which will be very useful for us for actually writing some amplitudes down. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I will discuss uh, uh, two classes of theories, namely gauge uh, supergravities and Yamil's Einstein supergravities uh, with non compact gauge groups, and I will present uh, an example of each about a simple double copy realization. Um, so, um, with other words, um, uh, um, uh, when, when we put out the, the review about double copies and color kinematics duality, we have this notion of a web of double copy constructible theories, uh, which we visualize um, in, in the review with this picture. Um, the notion being that there's uh, uh, many gravitational theories or string theories which are connected sometimes secretly by sharing common gauge theory factors which enter the double copy constructions. So more specifically today, I want to uh, expand, uh, uh, describe, uh, uh, investigate a little bit these two nodes, this gauge supergravities and Yamil's Einstein theories with the, the particular case in which the gauge groups of these Yamil's Einstein theories are non-compact. Okay, um, so what are these nodes? Uh, gauge supergravities are supergravities in which a subgroup of the R symmetry is promoted to gauge symmetry uh, in a way that uh, some matter fields uh, end up being charged under, under um, this symmetry. Uh, it should be said that gauge supergravities, perhaps by the amplitude communities, are not as well known as the engaged versions thereof, but they have been uh, with us since the very beginning. So the first gauged version of n equal to eight supergravities are coming from the same papers, which has essentially gave us n equal to eight supergravities or for the purpose of this talk, I should say, n equal to eight engaged supergravity to, to describe the theory we all love and know very well. Um, throughout the eighties, so a long time ago, there was uh, quite a bit of progress in finding new gaugings for these theories. That is new ways of, promoting a subgroup of the IR symmetry to uh, non-ability gauge interactions in the supergravity theory. And uh, I should say that it has been a long-standing problem uh, to obtain a classification of all possible gaugings. Um, this uh, problem has been uh, addressed by some very important work at the beginning of uh, the 2000, um, uh, which gave us the embedding tensor formalism. This is work by Nikolai DeWitt, uh, Santreben, and Trilliante, which gave us essentially um, what is uh, the tool of choice today uh, by the supergravity community to describe uh, gaugings. Um, and uh, it should be noted that since then, new gaugings have been discovered. In other words, this is uh, a topic of current research in the supergravity literature. In particular, new families of uh, gauging in four dimensions were discovered in 2012 13 uh, by the Padua group. And uh, uh, there is also uh, important results in five dimensions early this year. So these results are a few months old. Um, 
a natural question should arise for us. That is, can we realize some of these theories as double copies? Or maybe an even more natural question is, uh, can the double copy teach something to the supergravity community in this respect? So moving on to the other node, young mills einstein theories with non-compact gauge groups. What are these? Um, I will specialize to the case of five dimensions in which the Lagrangians, the theories are easier to write down, they are more under control, uh, and the case of n equal to two supersymmetry. Um, in five dimension, Maxwell-Einstein supergravities uh, can be written in an easy form, uh, thanks to work uh, um, by Morat and collaborators dating back to 84. Um, and the bosonic part of the supergravity Lagrangian fits one line. And we see the general structure here that we have scalar dependent matrices appearing in the kinetic term force vectors and scalars. And then uh, there is this term, which look like F wedge F wedge A, uh, and is controlled by a symmetric tensor with indices running over the number of vector multiples in the theory. Um, a fundamental result, which uh, I have no way of showing right now, but it will be used and will be pervasive in this talk, is the fact that all quantities in the Lagrangian are expressed in terms of this CAJ case. So we are in a situation in which theories are specified by this tensor, which in turn can be read off three-point interaction. So this is very good for us because we know that if we know three-point amplitudes, we know everything for these theories. Um, okay, these are Maxwell-Einstein theories. So uh, the procedure for turning them into Jan Mills einstein theories is uh, uh, fairly straightforward, although I'll be rather descriptive here. Uh, these CAJK tensors, they sometimes admit groups of symmetries or of isometries, which since the CAJK tensor specifies everything, they are then symmetries of the full theory. We can promote a subgroup of this group of symmetries uh, to a local symmetry by essentially covariantizing Lagrangians and adding some extra terms to prefer supersymmetry. And for simplicity, we will not touch their symmetry group. Otherwise, we would have a, a uh, real gauge supergravity with n equal to two supersymmetry. We want just the Mills Einstein theories. So the R symmetry is off limits for us. Um, in general, for these theories, the group of isometries G will be non compact. And uh, uh, we have the options of also choosing the, the gauge, the, the local symmetry group K to be non-compact as well. Uh, this is something in which supergravity deviates uh, from our intuition from gauge theory. If you try to write down a gauge theory with a, a, a non-compact gauge symmetry, you will end up having problems with unitarity. Um, however, supergravity is nice enough so that uh, when you have a non-compact gauge symmetry, it's always broken either to the maximal compact subgroup or further down. So that de facto, these supergravity theories can have um, non-compact uh, local gauge symmetry without having problems. And this is, again, a typical feature of some uh, supergravity theories, which we don't find uh, in gauge theories. Um, OK. So on the way of motivation, let me explain a little bit more why I think that these theories are interesting. Uh, gauge supergravities, first of all, arise very naturally in string theory. Uh, they, are, they are coming from compactification with fluxes, and they have a lot of interesting physical features. Um, messing gravitini, non-trivial potential, spontaneously broken supersymmetry, uh, non-compact gauge groups. And uh, uh, it would be nice to know how all this physics translates itself into amplitudes. Um, young mills einstein theories. Uh, have, have some of the features of gauge supergravities, but are simpler theories. So we can look at Yamin's Einstein theories as toy models sometimes uh, for the gauge supergravities, which are, make way more complicated. Uh, from the point of view of the double copy, however, these two classes of theories share some common building blocks, some, some of the gauge theories entering into construction. Uh, so this is why, in a sense, morally, they should be treated together. Uh, further on the way of motivation, um, there has been a lot of recent progress in Yamil Einstein theories from the point of view of amplitudes, which typically touches simple versions thereof. So it would be nice to expand, to, to extend, to expand this progress uh, in reference to uh, gauge, gauge supergravities and more complicated Yamil Einstein theories. 
Um, and uh, above all, probably from the amplitude perspective, we would not like to, to better understand the picture I put uh, on the slides in the very beginning, this web of theories. And we would like to address the questions, are all gravities double copies of something? Uh, so for all this reason, it makes sense to study, to study these theories from the point of view of amplitudes. Very good. So um, now, as I said, I would like to review or to address or to discuss uh, um, two of the main technical tools which enter um, double copy construction for these classes of theories. Um, the first uh, uh, issue I would like to address is uh, the, what happens to uh, color kinematics duality in theories with fermions. Um, and in order to do so, I would like to, to consider a very simple um, Lagrangian here, a very simple theory that is a theory with uh, um, Jan Mills, a Jan Mills theory uh, with some scalars in the adjoint and some fermions, which can be in a representation either in the adjoint or in a meta representation. I will keep the representation generic for this slide at least. Um, and I would like to consider a massive deformation thereof. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, M here is uh, a mass matrix for the fermions. Very good. So um, in order to use double copy construction, we would like to first uh, uh, ensure or check whether the, the gauge theories un under consideration uh, obey color kinematics duality. And there is a lot we can learn from this seemingly simple uh, class of theories by uh, looking at uh, color kinematics duality in different kinds of amplitudes. So First of all, say that we are looking at amplitudes with four fermions. Um, we have that color kinematics duality, if you choose to impose it, they uh, gives us the identity, which is essentially um, equivalent to, to, to the existence of supersymmetry in that dimension. So the, this is a well-known fact, uh, which has been with us for a while. Um, about the relation between uh, color kinematics in theories with adjoint fermions uh, and supersymmetry. The two, they go together. Um, okay. Independently on we want to have adjoint fermions or not, however, we can also look at color kinematics duality in theories, uh, uh, in um, amplitudes, sorry, with two fermions and two scalars. We do this and uh, we have uh, two constraints. The first one tells us really that uh, these matrices, which appear in uh, the Yukawa couplings, uh, they should be called gamma, they are gamma matrices because they, they obey the Clifford algebra. That is uh, um, our adjoint scalar should be thought of as coming from the dimensional reduction of a Yam Mills theory in higher dimension. And then there is this constraint and this is an interesting constraint um, because it relates the mass matrix for the fermions with these F capital Fs, which appear in the trilinear couplings of scalar fields. Um, and uh, uh, in turn, these, these Fs, uh, as they appear in the trilinear couplings for the scalar fields, are related to uh, the gauge interactions of uh, um, the double copy theory of the theory, which is the output of the double copy construction. Uh, it's easy to see this because you can consider an amplitude uh, between three scalar coming from this theory. You double copy that with an amplitude with three gluons from the other theory. And you are getting uh, an amplitude essentially, which tells you that uh, non-abelian gauge interactions are on in the supergravity theory coming from double copy. In fact, if you look at the four scalar amplitude and the impose color kinematics to it, you have that these F tensors uh, with three indices running over the number of scalars in this theory, uh, they obey the Jacobi relation. So they are uh, for real uh, to be thought of, uh, as the structural constant of something and that something indeed is uh, uh, the gauge symmetry of the output of the double copy. So there is a lot we can learn just, just by looking at this uh, theory and imposing color kinematics to it on various amplitudes. Um, now there are two different classes of theories of interest for us that uh, fall into this Lagrange. Uh, the first class of theories is uh, the one obtained by essentially claiming that uh, uh, this representation R is really a joint. So I should have, just kidding, it's the adjoint. And in this particular case, what, what do we have? These are 
massive deformations of a supersymmetric figure. Um, the simplest example being a massive deformation of n equal to four superior mills, where this massive deformation can as well explicitly break supersymmetry. But in the massless limit, you have good old n equal to four superior mills. Uh, these theories will enter the book of reconstruction for gauge supergravities, or specifically for gaugings of n equal to eight supergravity. But there's also another option. You can just consider matter fermions, not care about this identity here, and just impose constraint number two, and of course, uh, the, the Jacobi relation on the Fs. Uh, it turns out actually tiers of this class uh, are massive deformation of uh, uh, theories entering the double copy construction, not for n equal to its supergravity, but for homogeneous Maxwell Einstein supergravities with n equal to two supersymmetry. So also these theories enter famous or well known double copy constructions. Um, and so once we consider these massive deformations obeying the constraints from color kinematics to reality, we can consider double copy constructions for Young Mills Einstein theories. Uh, and it will turn out that these examples have non compact gauge groups as, as advertised. Um, okay. The second main uh, uh, point of uh, um, uh, technical improvement I wanted to discuss very quickly is a version of the spinorelicity formalism for five dimensions. I mean, the generalization of the familiar uh, 4D spinorelicity formalism to five dimensions. Um, we will see also this presents analogies with uh, the, the 6D um, formalism. Um, and for us, it's going to be very useful for writing, for presenting some expressions of the amplitude. In short, this is done by uh, dressing null momenta, for example, in 5D by gamma matrices and expressing the result as uh, essentially in terms of uh, uh, two uh, spinners, which solve the massless Dirac equation, um, where there is, uh, uh, they carry an SU2 little group index, which is contracted between the two. So this is in a sense analogous to uh, what we have in four dimensions, but also very similar for the version in six dimensions. Uh, the difference with uh, both is that in five dimension, um, one, these are constrained objects in the sense they solve the massless Dirac equation. Um, and uh, uh, by introducing a reference spinner, one can also have a massive version thereof. The massive version has uh, bold face spinners following the standard notation where normally bold face spinners are for massive fields. Uh, and since the little group now is SU2 times SU2, there is two different indices, distinct indices. A massive momentum can also be expanded in a very similar way, where you have like a contribution coming from the angle spinners and a contribution from the square spinners. Um, very quickly, with the help of this formalism, we can write convenient expression for massless polarizations, see two SU2 indices, and then massive uh, vector polarizations, one SU2 left and one SU2 right index. Um, for the expression I present, it will make sense to dress these uh, uh, polarizations with auxiliary variables carrying little group indices, this Z and W. And then uh, there's a very convenient short end notation in which brackets uh, that is um, matrices which are built essentially using the USP4 uh, matrix and contracting to spinners, um, they are uh, matrices in uh, the SU2 or in the little group indices. And we can represent essentially these matrices in uh, between vectors of these auxiliary variables. Um, I do not have time to enter in the details, but supersymmetry is easily introduced in this formalism. This is one of the reasons why this is advantageous. And as I mentioned before, it's closely related both to the six dimensional formalism and uh, a particular version of uh, four dimensional superfields, non chiral superfields. Very good. Now, um, as advertised, I move on to the main two examples I want to discuss with these tools. So uh, gauge supergravities um, with Minkowski backgrounds, with Minkowski vacuum, are very closely related to spontaneously broken supersymmetry. Uh, in a nutshell, when what does it mean that we have a gauge supergravity? It means that there exists a covariant derivative uh, acting on the gravitino with respect to some gauge symmetry. 
if you write down the minimal coupling term coming from that, you realize that uh, it's not invariant under linearized Suzy transformation. That means that since you can no longer use the linearized Suzy transformation to reduce the physical polarization of the gravity, you know, that need, needs to become massive. Otherwise, you don't have the right number of physical polarization. So if you want to start from scratch in, in uh, uh, formulating a double copy construction involved for a gauge supergravity, you will need to have a theory, a pair of theories can give you uh, a massive gravitino. Uh, there is only one thing I can think at, or I've been able to think at in the, the past few years, that is the double copy of uh, a theory on the Coulomb branch, that is a theory with W bosons, and uh, some uh, uh, spontaneously broken, uh, sorry, some uh, explicitly broken version of EMS theory with fermions so that the masses of the fermions match the one of the W boson that they can double copy together. Um, just to give an example, so, so that I can also illustrate how this uh, 5D spinorealistic formalism works, uh, so if you, you want to express- minutes, including questions. All right, very good. Thanks. Um, I, I, we can uh, um, write down the, the amplitude between two gravitinians and the vectors in this way. Uh, and again, notice what I was advertising. There's these matrices here in the little group indices. Um, and uh, there are these vectors of auxiliary variables. And of course, you know, since you take the same auxiliary variables on both sides of double copy, they select you know, the gravitino, um, the right little group gravitino representation in this way. Um, a couple of words are now to discuss uh, the uh, Yamil's theory of explicitly broken um, supersymmetry. You start from a solution of the constraint I show uh, when I talked about color kinematics duality for theories um, for uh, theories with massive fermions, and then you use some uh, orbifold procedure essentially to truncate out some representation, which ends up generating some matter representation by breaking the adjoint into various pieces and then throwing away through an orbifold construction, uh, some of those. Uh, there are some consistency requirements uh, you have to consider. For example, you have to mass, uh, match the masses on both sides of the double copy. And of course, you need to recover n equal to eight supergravity uh, in the massless limit. So a concrete example uh, of this construction is uh, that we start from a solution in seven dimensions of the constraint, which cannot be uplifted to seven dimensions. Um, this is a solution which have these trilinear couplings in the scalar, this tensor here, be the same as a structural constant for SU2, so, so that that in turn produces an SU2 gauge invariance, uh, unbroken gauge invariance in the output of the double copy. Then we use a specific or before projection so that uh, uh, various fields from, uh, um, from the, the theory obtained in this way um, can be represented in uh, SU um, 3N matrices sitting in, the, in these places here. And an important ingredient is that uh, represented as different by fundamental representation, but we identify, we combine two representations here. Um, because the double copy does not require irreducible representations, that just requires the representation of the gauge group. Uh, and doing this allows us essentially to get n equal to eight uh, ungauged supergravity in the massless limit. Um, so uh, there are these various, uh, this is double copy with an spontaneously broken n equal to four superior mills on the Coulomb branch. Um, and there's various uh, consistency matching um, conditions which needs to be implemented. For example, you need to match the masses. And the resulting spectrum actually is the one of a theory which has been recently investigated by the supergravity community. This is a gauging of n equal to eight supergravity with a broken SU2 times U1 gauge group and n equal to four residual supersymmetry. Uh, with this construction uplifts to five dimensions and the five dimensional version of this gauging was obtained actually earlier this year. Of course, there's some open problems here about obtaining gaugings with uh, uh, N uh, uh, residual supersymmetry, which is less than four and larger unbroken gauge group. Okay, uh, very quickly about Yamil's Einstein theories of non-compact gauge groups. Uh, there's a version of 
the constructions uh, for homogeneous Maxwell Einstein supergravities, which involves n equal to two supersymmetry with a, a hyper on one side, and then a theory with scalars and matter fermions. Uh, we consider a particular example in which you have three scalars and two matter fermions, uh, and this is uh, known as it's a famous theory by the supergravity community. This is a magical Maxwell Einstein supergravity uh, associated to the complex division algebra. Um, it has eight vector multiplets. And uh, in this example, we consider two um, gauge theories entering the construction. The first one is an n equal to two theory in five dimensions with some um, with uh, with an hyper, and uh, uh, we go we go on the Coulomb branch. Uh, we have simple uh, supersymmetry breaking so that the fundamental in which the hyper is transformed gives you the two fundamental of the two gauge theory factors in which it's broken. On the other end, we have a non supersymmetric theory with these two fermions, as I said. Um, and uh, um, these three scalars, and uh, um, we consider, um, we, we associate some masses to two of the three scalars to which form then a complex scalar. Uh, color kinematics duality gives you a relation between masses of the fermions and this lambda, which appears as a parameter appearing in the trilinear couplings. This is the same as the constraint I showed in one of the earlier slides. And the result is again that we have different representations here. Uh, double copies from fields or states from the le left and right theories, some mass matching here, and we end up having a supergravity theory which uh, uh, has uh, uh, two massless vector multiplets of, of the eight. And then uh, we have six or either three pairs of massive vector multiplets with different masses. And the relation with the masses coming from spontaneously broken gauge theory. Uh, it turns out actually that this is uh, something you can match uh, with uh, uh, an SU 2,1 gaugings of the complex magical theory. Um, OK, there's some sample amplitudes here. I don't have the time to comment on because I'm running out of time. Um, I should just mention that there is work in progress regarding non-compact gaugings for other magical or homogeneous uh, supergravities. So um, to conclude, from the point of view of the double copy, this uh, uh, very complicated act of turning on, uh, uh, turning and engage supergravity into, into a, a gauge version thereof corresponds to a seemingly simple massive deformation for the gauge theories involved in the construction. There is some open problems here, including difficulties about realizing gaugings which have large unbroken uh, gauge groups, residual gauge groups. This is difficult from the point of view of the double copy. Um, but uh, on, uh, if you want to ask the question, what does it take to study the double copy uh, constructions of theories which are of current interest from the supergravity community, uh, you will end up uh, dealing with theories with a lot of matter representations for the gauge theories and different supergravity fields which have different sources, essentially looking at tables like this one. This is, uh, believe it or not, a simple case. Uh, the 5D spin relativity formalism is, uh, at least to my mind, a major technical improvement in the sense that it bypasses the need of going to four dimensions, uh, doing dimensional reduction at the level of the Lagrangian to then use uh, the spinorelicity formalism in four dimensions. So for us, uh, allows us to streamline a lot of the work we've been doing on this topic. Um, and finally, uh, an open question is uh, how much mileage can we get out of three-point amplitude? So the name of the game here has been to identify three-point amplitudes where information about the theory is manifest. So what does it mean? Which theory are we sitting in? Well, we are looking at amplitudes in five dimensions between three vectors, and we read the CIJ case. And then, in principle, we know what theory we are dealing with. Um, is this uh, a theory with non-abelian gauge interaction at the level of supergravity? We just look at amplitudes between three vectors, and we read off the structural constant. 
Is this against supergravity? Well, we look at amplitudes between two gravitini and a vector, and we check whether there is something which looks like a minimal coupling in the supergravity Lagrangian. So the name of the game here is try to get as much mileage as possible out of three-point amplitudes. However, uh, eventually at some point, we'll have to start looking at four-point amplitudes. There may be theories which are not completely specified by three-point interactions. Uh, and on this note, I think I'll thank you and uh, apologize for being out of time, I guess. Thanks, Marco, for a nice and clear talk. Are there any questions for Marco? No, no. Um, yeah, hi. Hi, Marco. Um, hi. Yeah, great to see uh, spinners in funny dimensions being useful. Um, I was wondering, um, well, if memory serves, there's some accidental isomorphism in five dimensions. Um, SO5 is SP4 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, does that play any role in the amplitudes, like the spinner helicity forms of the amplitudes you were looking at? Or? Uh, yes, because uh, I mean we would not be able. So, so this US before as uh, the the invariant matrix, like this omega matrix, which is what we use yeah. to write brackets. Um, you may be able. So, uh, I suspect that there's also a way of uh, looking at this formalism as the sixties spinorality formalism, quote unquote, and a, with a clever way of breaking essentially Lorentz invariance on the sixth. Uh, dimension, uh, which in turn would again give you this extra matrix, this omega, which give you a USP4. But I would say without the USP4, uh, I do not know how to use the, the five-dimensional uh, spinorelicity, so it's an integral part from line one. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. thanks. More questions for Marco? I have a question. Um, you, you gave this example uh, of the of the uh, super gravity you got from taking double copy of uh, n equals four on the Coulomb branch with uh, um, non supersymmetric gang mill. Um, mm -hmm. So for n equals four on the Coulomb branch, there's this nice story by Kiermaier from a while ago that you could get all the amplitudes by looking at self limits in the mm -hmm. uh, theory, just at n equals four at the origin. Do you know if anything like that, is there anything nice about self limits in this? Uh, this gauge supergravity. Um, okay, so this is a very this is a very good question. I I have not thought uh, or right, I've thought a little about that, but I don't have any definitive uh, story. I mean, of course. Um, when we are considering soft limits uh, um, at the level of the supergravity, you would like these soft limits to probe the symmetries of the theory, right? So we know that um, this uh, n equal to eight supergravities and gauge versions thereof, they have these large isometry groups. So it would like be nice to uh, use the soft limits to probe that. And in fact, it has been done. Um, without invoking the double copy. And of course, another thing you would like to see is, is the following, right? Um, a gauge supergravity as a residual supersymmetry, in the particular example I gave n equal to four, but this is still uh, uh, n equal to eight supersymmetric. It's just that this n equal to eight, half of the supersymmetry are spontaneously broken down. So, so it would be nice but I do not know how to do it at this point in time, to use exactly what you said to understand the half of the supersymmetry which have been spontaneously broken by this intricate construction. Um, but as I said, I don't have anything uh, definitive on this at this point in time. Thanks. More questions for Marco? If there are no more questions, let's thank Marco again. And uh, we break for lunch.